Welcome everyone to Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you'll find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories impacting our communities. I'm your host, Sheena Yap Chan. My special guest joining me today is Jessica Chen. She's a choreographer and dancer who uses movement as a vehicle to heal wounds, share stories, and better understand our human existence. Jessica believes that the visceral experience of witnessing a moving body can elicit a profound sense of empathy, and that empathy is vital in navigating today's cultural landscape. Jessica is the art director of a contemporary dance company based in New York City called J. Chen Project, whose mission is to create dance works that deconstruct identity, cultural diversity, and belonging, and to promote radical, equitable access to the arts. Hi, Jessica. Welcome to the Asian Pacific Voices Radio. First off, could you start off by telling us about your life growing up? Yeah. Hi, Sheena. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to join. Yes, I was born in Southern California and grew up in a town called Hacienda Heights, which is located about 25 minutes from downtown Los Angeles, uh, without traffic, of course. And my parents were born and raised in Taiwan and immigrated here to the United States for their master's degree. Uh, my dad in electrical engineering and my mom in computer science. And they met in California through a work friend and I'm their firstborn. So I'm the oldest of three daughters. And I'm also the first in my whole family to be born in the US. So I grew up uh, in Southern California. Awesome. And that's amazing. And have you ever been to Taiwan uh, in, ever? <laughs> yeah, I spent um, a lot of time in my childhood in Taiwan. My, my grandparents, my mom's, uh, my mom's parents, well, and my father, my father's dad, um, they lived in Taiwan. And so when uh, at a, I think I was four years old, I went to Taiwan for a whole summer and my grandparents took care of me um, throughout that time. My mom was pregnant with my second sister, my first my first younger sister, and uh, she was also working at the time, so they needed a little bit of help. So I actually spent quite a bit of time in Taiwan and then my grandparents later on moved to the US. So we grew up with them in the household. Awesome. That's always great to have family around the household. Now, you mentioned your dad as an electrical engineer. Your mom was in computer science. Uh, You're in dance. So, you know, when was the first time you realized dancing was something that you wanted to pursue? Yeah. So, you know, growing up uh, with my sisters, uh, Stephanie and Ariel, and my cousins, like Charles, Emily, Stacey, and James, I used to, like, one of my favorite memories was just creating plays and dances and casting them all in my production. (laughs) So my uncle, um, Emily and Stacy's father, he still to this day asks like, Oh, when are the performances? When, when's the performance whenever we have a family gathering? Um, And so growing up, it was a really joy, joyful time um, during those times. And so I've always had that interest and curiosity in creating an experience for people to enjoy and uh, I, I've done that my whole life and but when I when I first became really when I first kind of started my formal training in dance was in my Saturday Chinese school so I grew up in a pretty robust Chinese American community so thankful for that and we had an amazing, Chinese school system. And so every Saturday I would go there um, and learn Mandarin. And at the start of that day, I would, I would dance. And from the beginning, I just loved it. I, I, it gave me really a way to express myself. I was a really shy child and um, I was a really shy child. So um, even before I started school, I didn't have much exposure to English. And so I had some communication challenges as well. So it was hard for me to make friends in school initially. But once I started dancing, every I was, I was small, so I was always put front and center. 
And you think because I was shy off stage that maybe that would translate on stage, but it, it really didn't. I was never afraid. I never had any stage fright. And then all of my you know, best friends were my dance friends. And I think from day one, dance was my home. Dance was my love. And it was this way of me kind of being in the world. And so I danced my whole life. And then, but that there was like that moment in college, and I still remember that um, because my parents are electrical engineers, computer science, dance was not the path that they had carved out for me. And, um, and, but dance was so vital through, you know, the junior high, high school times, it was my identity. But when I went to college, I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, initially as a business econ major. When I went, I had in my mind that I would I would retire <laughs> in a sense. Um, the dance would always be a part of my life, but then I would start, I would, you know, start my journey towards what my career would be. Um, but I knew that I always, I always needed dance in my life. So I tried out and, and got into our UCSB cheer squad. Um, so I was a, in the, a collegiate cheerleader for two years, and I thought that was going to give me enough. But it, you know, cheerleading was a lot of stunts, so I got thrown up in the air. It was really exciting, but there was not as much dance. So I went to our dance department and I sought out more dance, and I was taking a dance, uh, a jazz class, my freshman year, and our teacher showed us this documentary of the amazing renowned, brilliant choreographer Alvin Ailey and his masterpiece, Revelations. And that was the first time I'd seen it, the first time I was exposed to modern dance. And I just watched that documentary. And I, I remember thinking to myself, like, oh, my God, like, what are they doing? They're, they're literally speaking with their bodies. Um, and I, in that moment that I can, I can still remember very clearly, I remember thinking, I want to do that. Uh, so I would say that Alvin Ailey inspired me to pursue a career in, in making dances. I, I love that. And thanks for sharing that. And I know you mentioned, this is why I mentioned what, what your dad and mom did for a living, because, you know, electrical engineering, computer science, and then being the oldest child in an Asian family, you know, you're like the responsible one, the one that you're supposed to be the model for your si younger sisters, but you went to do dance. And mm -hmm. so when you decided that, you know, what was your parents' reaction? You know, were they mad? Were they like, why didn't you continue with economics or business? How are you going to make, how are you going to feed yourself from dancing? You know, I was just curious. Yeah. So I entered college as a business econ major. Um, after my first day in Econ 1, I was like, I don't think this is where I want to be. Um, I ended up getting my bachelor's in global studies. And I love, I mean, I'm a product of globalization. So it was, I love history. I love learning about it. Um, I love learning about the stories that built what we are experiencing now. And um so when I transferred my major from business econ to global studies, I didn't get any push from that. My parents were like, okay. Um, I, my whole life have been very opinionated and very, um, I think because I'm the oldest, I was the first one born here. There's that level of pressure and that expectation that's put on first generation, especially the oldest that I felt even as a little child. And so I've always been very like hyper vigilant, very like doing lots of things all at once. Um, and reflecting back on my childhood, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. You know, my parents were figuring out the American system as adults, but I was with them as a child also figuring it out and so i think at a very young age i understood that responsibility and so i was always like very like hyper vigilant and very opinionated and i remember i think i was 10 years old i was i must have gotten into trouble doing something and i was being lectured by my dad and i gave a counter to his lecture um 
And I think I was just about to get like my punishment, like whatever it was going to be. Um, and I countered him. And then in that moment, he was like, huh, you should be a lawyer. And that was like his tone from 10 years old on. So as a global studies major, I, um, I, I ran a student group that, that created this international bill of rights. I was still under that realm of law. And I was kind of thinking of pursuing international law. And so he was okay on board with that, on board with that. And then I did study for the LSATs and I was planning to go to law school. And then I decided that I wanted to give myself a graduation present and I wanted to give myself a year of dance after graduation. Um, and I had taken the LSATs, but if anybody that has taken the LSATs knows that if you, once you get your score, if anybody has taken the LSATs before knows that once you get your first score, if you're not satisfied with it, you, you can take the LSATs again, but they average the scores. So that very first score is critical. And there's three sections to the LSATs. Long story short, one of the sections I was always stellar in. I got 100% every practice test. And I, and in the actual LSAT, I didn't finish that section. So I knew it wasn't my best score. So I ended up canceling that score because you can cancel it, but then you never know what the score was. I, can't, I took the LSATs, I canceled my score, planning to take it again, never took it again. <laughs> Went to New York for my one year gift to myself to just to dance, simply to dance. I didn't, I wasn't saying I was gonna pursue a professional career in dance, just said this has been my love my whole life. It follows me around, it gives me a way to process my experiences. Um, my thoughts, my feelings, it gives me a way to connect to others. I'm going to give myself that gift before I go to law school. And um, I never, and then I, I never left New York. I came, I, 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 I also auditioned for the Alvin Ailey uh, Summer Dance Intensive. So that's what brought me to New York initially. I had that like start date and I had an end date too for that program. Um, I just then extended it and then extended it and extended it. So I never had like a sit down conversation with my parents telling them, hey, y'all, I'm going to become a professional dancer and then become yeah. a professional choreographer. I never had that conversation. It just kind of like, I went to New York that one year and then I, I just kept extending that one year. Um, that's not to say that they have not ha like had conversations with me throughout this whole process. Like, you know, what's, what's the life. Um, it just wasn't all in one. And yeah, I think my dad definitely resisted it more. My mom has always been, um, she, they both struggle with it in different ways. Um, I think my dad is like more like, like practical about it. My mom loves that I'm pursuing what I love, but also thinks about the stability. Um, so she's all for me, like going for my passion, but she questioned like what, what comes up is like, well, how are you going to like survive and how, you know? Um, so those are the things my dad, it just doesn't get it. <laughs> He's like, what <laughs> you were supposed to go to law school <laughs> or like, become um you know lead a, a a corporation or something um and even throughout as I started JTM project and as I like progressed in my career he would see how I was succeeding as a professional and then he would use that say oh see these skills that you're using here while you're running your dance company you can utilize you know working for a bank and I'm like yeah that's great dad so that's not what I'm doing um, so I think he always kind of hoped that maybe I would, I would like pivot and I would um, jump ship. And um, at, at one point I did have a conversation with my dad and he was like, I'm not going to convince you to go to law school or to go to business school anymore. And then he started trying to give advice to me on like the performing arts. So 
I mean, you know, <laughs> parents are going to be parents. Um, so he did kind of make that switch at one point. I was like, okay, well, maybe now I can give her advice on like how to run a dance company. <laughs> so in some ways they've accepted it, but I think in many ways they probably will just never really fully understand um, what I do and and how I live. <laughs> Yeah. And I, and you know, that's okay. Right. If they don't know, uh, they might not understand it, but they're, they're always there for you. And of course they come from a different generation where you've been taught one way of living, right. One way of success. Like you go to school, get a job, never rock the, rock the boat, you work, you know, 40 hours a week, you have the white picket fence, the house, but that's not everyone's dream. Kind of like yours, you know, you wanted to dance and no matter what you did, dance always appeared in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. It was just a sign that you were just meant to do that. That's right. Um, and so the best thing is that your parents are there for you, even if they don't understand it. And not everyone is as lucky, right? Especially in Asian culture, because mm -hmm. it's so rigid at times where you feel like, you know, you're doing something wrong if you're doing something outside that path. But here you are, you have your own dance studio, you're trailblazing the way, you're showing others what's possible, that you can literally do what you love and and make money off of it right and of course you know it's not always easy there's always going to be challenges because when you do something on your own there's always ups and downs right so for like you uh jessica running the j chen project what what's that like you know what are what are some challenges you've been able to overcome along the way i mean i'm sure you've had your fair share <laughs> yeah i i i when i created j Chen project uh, it was in 2008 so it was two years after i graduated from college and it was it was conceived as a platform for me to cultivate and showcase my choreographic voice and it's grown to exceed those initial expectations um, and it's really blossomed into a whole nother uh, ball game so when I started, it was that platform and we had a fiscal sponsor. So if I ever wanted to apply for grants, I could use the fiscal sponsor to apply for grants. Um, but most of everything was self-funded. And then in 2017, I applied for our 501c3 nonprofit status and we put a board together and we, we got that approval in 2017. So then in 2018, it was my company's 10-year anniversary celebration. But at the same time, it was also our first year fully as a nonprofit with a board. And then fast forward to 2020, at the start of 2020, I told the board, our founding board, it was me and two others, three of us total, that I would like for us to expand we are we're ready you know we've had a couple of years under our belt to figure out our bylaws and our meeting structure and our company structure um i'm ready for us to expand and then within a few weeks of that we had three new board members that were eagerly wanting to sign on and that happened you know very organically and then we um voted in a seventh board member at our first board meeting in 2020, which was in March, which was supposed to be in person, but ended up being on Zoom. And so at the start of the pandemic, we doubled, more than doubled our board. And that has not only put in structure, more even more structure and, um, and guidance, but it also helped us sustain throughout the last, like the last few years. So that, that's really the progression of j Project. So my day-to-day -day has shifted um, and continues to shift. Um, right now, what's happening now is that we're getting ready to premiere uh, a new production called AAPI Heroes, Myths, and Legends. And it's premiering next Thursday, March 30th, 2023. And so... Uh, this morning, I had a production meeting with my stage manager, my uh, artistic assistant, and my light designer. And then uh, later on, I have a, a, meet, a phone call with our video production person who's going to video everything. 
And then later tonight, I'm going to be at a show up at Columbia at Barnard, the senior thesis dance show, because I choreographed a senior thesis for one of their dance majors. So that's my day today. Um, so it, it blends from like rehearsal to production meetings um, to grant writing um, and board meetings. And yeah, it varies every day very exciting yeah i i love that and um you know it's 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 not easy right at times right like you have to fund yourself and then people don't realize dance the dance industry is still a very male dominated industry right um to even like fight for your spot or whatever you may call it just to be seen you know you have to work a hundred times harder than the rest right but through persistence, you never gave up. And instead, you expanded, especially at a time where everyone was locked down three years ago and nobody knew what was going to happen. You pushed through, you know, and like you mentioned, everything happens for a reason, right? So um, at that time when you expanded your board, uh, it got better because of it. Mm -hmm. So it was maybe a, a blessing in disguise at the time. For sure. Um, and then here you are today. Yeah. And then here you are today creating shows, highlighting our community, um, showcasing what we do through dance, which I really love. And so I'm going to uh, kind of switch on another topic, if you're OK with that. Uh, I understand that about 10 years ago, you had miraculously, miraculously made it back after suffering a horrific car accident. Um, you know, it, would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Because I mean, especially as a dancer, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now at that moment 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, not at all. So it was August 11th, 2012. I was I was the passenger in a Mini Cooper convertible and we had a major car accident. The car flipped three times and landed upside down. And I was airlifted to the nearest hospital, the Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital, where I underwent eight hours of brain surgery and I spent the following 13 days in a medically induced coma. Um, when I came out of the coma, I was in the trauma ward of the hospital for a few weeks and then transported to the, the rehabilitation hospital. I don't remember going into the car before the accident. I remember all the whole day up until that moment. And then I don't remember until I was being transported to the rehabilitation hospital. I was, um, I had broken bones all over my body. And so I was wheelchaired. And what I remember was the, the them clamping the wheelchair onto the, the bus that took me from the one hospital to the other hospital. I remember those noises. Those are the first things that I remembered. Um, there is a story of the moment I came out of the coma that um, I, I, they, cause when you're in a medically induced coma, there's, they, they try as, as fast as they can to pull you out. So the doctors will assess, you know, this is the day that we're going to, when she's stable, we're going to um, take her out of sedation. And so they had attempted it and and it didn't, it, it wasn't good. So then they brought me back into sedation. So this was like sec second attempt to come out of the sedation. And so my loved ones, my partner at the time, you know, they're they're in the room and this is the second attempt, the first one failed. And so they brought me out, I opened my eyes, I motioned for my partner to like, come towards me, like I have something to say. And so he leans in like his ear to um, my mouth. And <laughs> the first words that came out of my mouth was, get me the hell out of here. And then I proceeded days after to escape the hospital. Um, I didn't know, I, I, I'm assuming, because I don't remember this, I didn't know where I was and what had happened and that I, my, my, I had broken bones all over my body. But I had, I had then kept trying to escape the hospital. I thought I was like in some sort of a lockdown. I was like imprisoned. I even told somebody like, because what they ended up doing 
at one point they found me on the floor and I had broken my right my right um, fibula. So I was non-weight bearing. I somehow, maybe modern dance style, slipped onto the floor and was attempting to crawl myself out of the hospital door when the nurse found me. And that was their last straw. So they ended up strapping my wrists and my ankles to the bed and putting an alarm on my bed. So even if I moved really fast, the alarm would go off. And so I have a piece that I choreographed called First Words, and it's inspired by that moment because at that moment, I it was really frantic. You know, hospitals are not a nice place to be at. Nobody likes being at hospitals. And, um, and I thought that the nurses and doctors were like my prison guards. And then, but in the end, before I was discharged from the rehabilitation hospital, I, I, I made that transition of, of viewing them as my prison guards to viewing them as my protectors. And I didn't actually want to leave the hospital when it was time for me to leave the hospital. But in those moments, um, I was, I really, and I kept telling people, I, I have to go, I have to I have rehearsal, I have a show. Um, and there were a lot of stories of when people came to visit me I would tell them I was like on a set of a movie I like I just had I don't know what was going on but I think I was making up stories so that I could stay in bed like there was two things happening there was one part of me that was like I gotta get out of here and there was another part of me a little smarter that was like Jessica you gotta stay here that would then communicate to the other part saying like okay we're on a movie set this is the scene so you have to just lay in this bed (laughs) until the scene's over or something. I don't know. So those were the first moments that does set. I I tell that story because that does um, kind of set the standard of how I, I was like rehabilitated. I had like a sense of urgency of wanting to come back. And I also wanted to make sure that I healed fully from it. Um, So I never, and the doctors would tell me that I may never dance again. Like I would be weight bearing and I could walk and like, but at that time they didn't know. And I do remember this, that I would say, yes, no problem. Like, yes, I understand. And I would be polite to the doctors. This was after they had transitioned from my prison guards to my protectors. I did, I was polite with them and I said, yes, thank you. I understand. But in my head, I never had a doubt that I was going to get back on stage. In my head, I just knew like, they don't know. And it is true. Dancers will say this and there's no disrespect to the medical field, but doctors don't really know how strong dancers are and athletes are. Like there's like, there's like, mind over matter there is that there is that quality that that dancers have and um yeah so there was never a doubt in my mind maybe it was still the drugs in me I don't know but there was never really a doubt that I was going to get back on stage um I still nurse this in my right ankle injury it's not like it was before um, but there's no metal in it. There's, you know, I, it's, it's like a hundred percent me and it's, you know, something I monitor and I make sure I take care of. Um, but I returned back to the stage, um, 13 months after the accident. So. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And you're right. You know, your mind, when you have the mindset that you're just going to get back there, no matter what happens, you're going to make it happen. Um, and athletes do have a strong mindset because they got to go out there and put their best effort. I mean, I remember watching like Kobe Bryant videos and like what made him, you know, the champion that he is today. And it's because his mindset was strong. His work ethic was really strong. And so he had the right to brag that he was the best because he practiced day in and day out, a thousand shots a day 
just so that he can be the best. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so dancing is kind of the same thing. You practice, practice, For put sure. in your 10,000 hours and being able to do that, it builds your muscle too. Right. Because now you have, um, you know, more core to like lift yourself up or, you know, do high kicks or whatever other dance moves that you have to do. Um, but you know, the story is, is so like when you said the car flip three times, like, I think my eyes was like, what? Uh, and then you're here today sharing the story. Right. Yeah. Um, and stories like this is something we love to hear, right? Because, you know, sometimes we're in this like darkness or this this setback or this pushback and we feel like it's the end of the world mm -hmm. when really it's just a little delay. It's right. a little delay. It's temporary. Everything happens for a reason and we can always learn from it. So mm -hmm. That's right. I'm so grateful that you were able to share that story. And, you know, to the people who's listening to your episode, you know, they've been inspired by what you do and they probably want to go out there and forge their own path. I know you have um, a project called, uh, no, you, you, uh, you have a project, right? Called Safe Project that addressed xenophobia targeting Asian Americans in 2021. How do you feel using the power of dance is important in advocating for change and even activism regarding these issues targeting our Asian community? Mm -hmm. So You Are Safe is a dance piece that I created in 2021, and it is our closing piece for AAPI Heroes, Myths, and Legends. And You Are Safe is a piece that specifically highlights the, the current state of um, AAPIs in, in, in really showcasing what it's like to be Asian in America in this moment. And we also pull in uh, the history. It's part of the Museum of Chinese in America's responses exhibition. So I was given that commission to to create a work from the, the, the tone of that exhibition. And so that piece is really powerful. It uh, I've gotten, you know, feedback from audience members who identify with the Asian diaspora saying this piece is the piece that um, most represented. I've never seen myself on stage until this moment, you know, really beautiful, uh, touching uh, t testimonies from our audience. And then also from, from non-AAPI saying, wow, I think not, I will never understand fully, but I have an insight into what is it that the, that the Asian community has to grapple with. It's a very powerful piece. Yeah, and I think that dance for me is the best way to to communicate and um, I and that was my intention to do it through this piece. Thanks for sharing that. It's great that you're able to use your dance to promote, to elevate our community, to raise awareness of the issues that we're still facing today. So I want to thank you again for being on the show. It's such an honor for you to be here today and to share your story. And, you know, if any of our listeners wanted to connect with you and check out the J Chen Project, uh, is there any website that we can check it out? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Sheena. Our website is jchenproject.com. We're also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Love to connect with your audience. Thanks so much. To learn more about Jessica, please visit jchenproject.com. We would love to also hear from you, our valued listeners, about any suggestions for future guests or topics. Also, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers our Asian and Pacific Islander communities with a voice through media arts. If you would like to support our program, please visit AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. I'm Sheena Yachan, and thank you for listening. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Pacific Voices Radio show. Take care until then, everyone.